Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to this first of three sessions today, panel discussions on global information literacy. Of the three special topics I'm doing during this conference, this was by far the most popular. So, uh, I'm not quite sure why. Is it topical? Anyway, the other ones, we, on Monday, we did a gap years, and that was actually quite brilliant. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion about the, the reasons that people are afraid of kind of stepping off of the traditional path and the ways in which a gap year can actually change things and the fear that it would change things, right? It's like, okay, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I want to change things. Uh, and then tomorrow we're going to do family sabbaticals, which should be a lot of fun. I, I'm increasingly seeing families that are taking time off and going somewhere in order to allow their kids to have an experience that's different, whether it's a language experience or just to experience a different culture and to see how different things are. Okay, so I'm going to start us off here quickly telling three short stories. When I was in high school, I went on an exchange program to Brazil for a year and lived with a Brazilian family. And they were lovingly, they were so nice to me. And they lovingly spent time trying to help me understand that my view of the world as an American teenager was not necessarily an accurate view. And I've been grateful for that forever since that time. Um, then we, my wife and I had our second daughter did a gap year in Nepal. And I went to visit her there and there are a gazillion American NGOs there doing work. And one uh, Nepali guy I talked to was very nice said, you know, truth be told, you could be here for 40 years and you still wouldn't really understand what's going on. And I think what he meant was all of the good intentions of these programs don't necessarily map to good outcomes. And in fact, it's really hard to even determine what a good outcome is. And I always think of uh, Carol Black's film, Schooling the World, where she shows in some ways the devastating results of Western style schooling in Northern India. Okay, my, so my third story is that I was recently on the board of a media literacy group and I had to resign. And I resigned because I actually felt like the members of the board weren't media literate. And it was really a struggle for me because I felt like I couldn't actually have a deeper conversation. There wasn't a good understanding of critical thinking, uh, of cognitive bias. There, there wasn't an understanding of uh, money in, in news and, and shaping of narratives. And it felt like um, I, uh, that someone, that, that when I was reading deeply about topics, I was watching other people just kind of go with the current intellectual political view of the day. And I thought, how can we teach deep information research and understanding if the adults don't know how to do it? So with that, let's go to you, Matt, and we'll let you start. And then we'll just go through the presentations and then we'll have lots of fun conversation, I hope. Okay, great. Um, I can be heard? Yes. Okay, yes. it's important to check that. Okay, I'm clicking the share button. I'm gonna narrate as I do this, and maybe that will make it easier for others too. So You're teaching as you're doing it. There we go. All right, so then I get a pop-up and it shows all the windows, and I think I'm clicking on the right one. Yes, we see it. You see it, okay, great. All right, so I will kick us off, and I'm gonna run a timer on my watch and try to keep us uh, on time. So my name is Matthew Vanderwerf, and I'm a senior technical advisor at IREX. IREX is a nonprofit organization. Um, we're based in the United States, but we, we work around the world. And one of the issues that we're working on is media literacy in the US uh, through a program that we call Learn to Discern. And today what I'd like to do is just share some of the results from a recent evaluation that we conducted that looks at whether students who have gone through our program are better equipped to detect false information than students who have not gone through our program. And I should say that this approach is something that we're using in the US. We've used it in communities in Arizona, in uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Missouri, uh, and we're looking to expand through partnerships elsewhere. The results that I'm sharing today are specifically from our pilot program in the Ukraine, 
where we first um, developed this approach and where we've built a partnership with the Ministry of Education there. And so the results that I'm sharing are from the first 50 schools to join that pilot program in Ukraine. So first, um, a little bit of background. Um, these results are from students in grades eight and nine. And I wanna say that um, the results are from, as I mentioned, the first 50 schools uh, to join the program. The uh, program will be national in scope. It'll eventually extend to 650 schools around the country. And then with plans that it would eventually be implemented everywhere. Um, one thing that's different about our approach to media literacy is that we're working with uh, the Ministry of Education. And so we're developing formal approaches to how we integrate this into the classroom. And that means that media literacy is not being taught as a separate standalone subject, but it's being integrated into existing subjects. So language arts, history and culture, uh, and art as well. And these results are based on a baseline study that was conducted in the fall of 2018, and then an end line that looked at results uh, uh, in December of 2018. So uh, as I mentioned, the rollout um, was in 2018. Um, we originally trained teachers at 50 schools, uh, and then we've integrated uh, this curriculum into those schools. Um, we're now in the process of expanding to 650 schools uh, across the country. And we wanted to know two things. So we had two important evaluating, evaluation questions. The first was, did the students who participated in this program, um, were they better equipped to detect disinformation? So if given a, a series of um, questions about their ability to identify uh, disinformation, did they, do, did they perform better than students who hadn't gone through the program? And then in a second question that we had that's almost as important um, had to do with behavior change. So we wanted to know whether students reported healthier uh, information consumption habits, right? So it's one thing to be able to perform well in a tested environment to show that you've gained skills, but it's an entirely different thing to, to have a change in how you consume uh, information. And so that was the second important question that we have. Now, um, in the interest of time, I won't go into our research methodology. And if you're interested in knowing more about the study or getting your hands on it, feel free to connect with me uh, after this conversation. I can also put you in touch with our evaluation experts who led this process. Um, but just to know that um, the study was, um, was launched in the fall of 2018, and we did use a control group, so a group of similar schools um, and similar students who were randomly selected um, who did not receive um, the program initially so that we, we could tell, we could understand better uh, what the change in results uh, actually looked like. So what did we find? The most important things. Um, students who received IREX's L2D lessons performed better on all assessment tasks. tasks. Uh, they were better at identifying facts and opinions, uh, fake stories, hate speech, um, and they also demonstrated deeper knowledge of the news media sector, which is a really important proxy indicator for all those other um, critical thinking tasks. Uh, secondly, the students also reported healthier media consumption habits and behavior, and they also viewed uh, critical information consumption skills as more useful in their own lives. Um, we also found that female students performed better than male students, both on the uh, tested tasks, uh, as well as in the self-reported behavior change. And then interestingly, we found that the students who had received uh, these lessons found the content that it was integrated into, the history lessons or the language arts lessons, more memorable and interesting than students who hadn't had it. So a couple of quick recommendations from us. Um, we are obviously very interested in expanding this work elsewhere. We're already doing it in the US and we have an interest in expanding more in the US. Um, we really wanna see media literacy integrated into subjects rather than taught just as a standalone subject. I think 
that we've seen some of the best models do this and we're big advocates for more of that. Uh, we also want to encourage a focus on quality. Uh, Steve, as you mentioned, there's a lot that passes for media literacy out there that doesn't really translate into improved skills. And uh, we want to ensure we're using approaches that have demonstrated results. And then finally, it goes without saying, maybe it doesn't, but media literacy is nonpartisan. And we really believe this is not about what you read, but about how you read. And that's something that we emphasize in all of our work as well. So I'm about at time now. Um, I'll say thank you. Happy to take any questions or continue a discussion. Yeah, feel free to put questions in the chat or to use the Q&A button. We're going to go through quickly each presenter. Keep notes. So if you have things you want to talk about, well, you can ask those questions. So Marina, how about you? <laughs> um, it was very interesting for me to listen to uh, Matthew because uh, I know for sure I know about this program and I even took part in some uh, developing of lessons for this uh, uh, media literacy integration program. Mm -hmm. And I would say it was a huge struggle. I know that they continue to do this uh, now. Uh, but it is um, connected to Ukraine's uh, like curriculum. It is very hard. Uh, we have a very strict number of hours for any uh, uh, subject. Uh, so when you say, okay, let's incorporate some media literacy, the teachers usually say, oh, thank you so much. I, I had, don't have enough hours for my own uh, subject to teach. Mm -hmm. So this is a constant struggle to explain to them that you can do both uh, simultaneously and uh, um, it enhances uh, the teaching. Mm -hmm. But what I personally see as a problem is uh, who are the teachers? We don't have time to prepare teachers for this. Uh, do you hear me now? Yeah, hello? Is something is wrong with my internet. We can hear you. I hear you. Uh, so, like, uh, there are lots of training sessions for them, and I see people coming out from these sessions, and they get very, very simple concepts of media literacy that uh, already do not work in this complicated world. Like, a very simple example is, uh, like, uh, several weeks ago, there was a very big protest in the city center. Uh, near our president's head headquarters. And uh, one of my ex-colleagues, a journalist, uh, made a photo that there are a lot of people in there. And say, look, you said nobody will come, but here we are, look how many people came here to protest. And the very first comment of the, uh, under this photo was a comment uh, of stop manipulating what this photo is really about. Where did you take it? How can we check when did you take it? and lots of such questions. And it was from a teacher. And I was thinking like, okay, we have learned her to, to ask uh, correct questions. Uh, we have taught her to think, what is she shown? If she feels some uh, strong emotions, she has, she has to check. She checks, but the results she gets, uh, she becomes more and more uh, narrow-minded. And uh, we have lots of talk uh, about how we can overcome it. So now I can see uh, the audio crossed out for all of you. We've all muted so that we're not interrupting you. Oh, have you? oh okay. So I'm worried because I can see my um, internet switch on and off. So the problem, uh, so the program works as a miracle for teenagers. They learn like in weeks. Maybe Matthew can uh, support this, that you can teach them like in several hours, they grasp the idea of media literacy very quickly and they are very efficient in using it. But when we come to teachers that uh, are 40, 50, 60 years old, it's a huge struggle and a huge problem and we need to put lots and lots of efforts to train the teachers. Oh, that's just such a fascinating point you've made. And thank you so much for doing that. Did you want to say anything else before we move on? Not now. <laughs> okay, good. Can't wait to hear more from you. And, and I'm not sure it was clear to everybody, but uh, Nadina, I'm sorry, um, Marina is in Ukraine. Okay, so uh, let's do Nadina now. So Nadina, okay. do you know how to share? Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, you picked it very well because I also have a connection with Ukraine and I was thinking about uh, what happened to me last year 
I attend in, uh, an uh, alumni ties uh, seminar in Kiev, Ukraine, and uh, there I learned for the very first time about uh, what media literacy is. Uh, like everybody else, I was thinking about uh, definitions and I wanted to know what really uh, media literacy is and uh, how we can deal with it because in this part of the world I'm from Romania not very many things were known at the time about media literacy so uh, at the time I started wondering what is media literacy and how can I uh, deal with it and uh, one of the first things I did as a teacher was to find out more about it and I found all kinds of definitions from the most uh, simple ones like um, I know uh, we, the ones which could be understood by everyone to the most academic ones, which only an, uh, an expert could find. Um, fortunately, I uh, ran into the so-called guru of the Russian media, and his name is Vasily Gatov. And uh, I would like to uh, tell you what he said. Uh, he spoke about the greatest battle of the 20th century, which was the battle for freedom of information and against censorship. And then, because we live in the 21st century, he said that the greatest battle will concern the abuse of freedom of information. And it made me think even more, what is this abuse of freedom of information? And I uh, realized at the time that sometimes we are simply overwhelmed by all kinds of information. As I am a teacher, I was interested not only in uh, what happens to me and uh, my entourage, let's say, but also what happens to my students. And I started doing a kind of a research and uh, I didn't limit myself to high schoolers because I teach in a high school. I wanted to know if uh, young students or uh, young kids are exposed to media. The result which I, I, uh, I found simply shocked me because I found out that kindergartners are exposed to 70 media messages every day. For me, this number 70 is simply shocking and I'm sure that uh, it won't be accurate in a year's time or in a six months time simply because um, technology is developing very, very easily. As for high schoolers, uh, the, the figures which I found didn't surprise me very much because uh, I know they spend a lot of time interacting with media and uh, on average they spend about one third of their lives. Then I went on and uh, I wanted to know on average how much time we spent dealing with social media because uh, this seems uh, to be the place where we get uh, the most uh, messages from and um, I found out that we spent five years and four months uh, on average on social media, but this is not the king. The king is actually watching TV, which uh, we all know is not an interactive uh, activity, but we spent seven years and uh, eight months. Of course, um, I was wondering if everything we find there is accurate and is trusted and uh, if we have to accept that information. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was lucky enough to find out about the uh, first draft, which is uh, a global nonprofit that uh, supports journalists and academics and uh, technologists who work to address the challenges related to trust and truth in the digital uh, age. Um, one of the co-founders co is called Claire Wardell, and she said that every time when we accept passively information without double checking or we simply share a post or image or a video before verifying it, we are doing nothing but adding to the noise and confusion. And I went on and I wondered why. And uh, the answer I found was because of uh, the mobile devices we all have such as uh, cell phones and uh, the newer uh, smartwatches, which do nothing but help us to adding to this noise and confusion. So all these figures are simply surprising for me and uh, this was the starting point for me to, to do something, at least in my community. Thank you so much, Nadina. Linda, did you want to use this moment now? Oh, your mic is off. There you Hi go. everyone. Um, I'm so blown away by what all you've all you've already said because it really speaks to 
um, the issues that I'm dealing with right now. I'm, I'm very close with a lot of different teachers and administrators around the world. Um, most specifically, Anne Michelson from Norway, who said to say hello to you, Steve. Um, she, uh, she's a teacher administrator at San Vica High School, who we've part, I've partnered with, with my students to work on the sustainable development goals. Um, I mean, if you don't know what they are, it's the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In 2015, 193 countries got together and signed an agreement to, to work on these 17 things like climate change and education and social justice um, to sustain our planets through 2030. So our students um, got really close. We actually had the Norwegians come over to our school, which is in Long Island, and we went over there. And while we were working on these projects, they're very, very specific. Like we got rid of, uh, for example, one of the things in our school, we got rid of uh, styrofoam and plastics. We've had uh, collections for women to get on their feet who've been trafficked. We've had all kinds of really incredible projects. But while the Norwegians were overworking with us, on, we, we set up the laptops for the kids to be paired up. We realized quickly that the kids didn't have access because the, we were only allowed to work on our network in the school. So this opened up this a lot of, we, we learned so much from this thereafter. Um, for example, um, we learned that the reason for this uh, blocking of things and not being able to collaborate outside of our network is because this, the district was concerned about the Children's Internet Protection Act. Okay, so this is really critical because it impacts all of the schools in the United States. So schools get funding for internet access and it's called E-rate funding. And in order to be eligible for the funding, you have to be compliant with the SIPA Act. And the SIPA Act basically has three components. One is you have to ensure that no pornographic images get across. You have to teach kids um, how to navigate the internet safely, which speaks to Matt and um, Nadine that we were talking about media literacy. And then um, you must also monitor kids. Now monitor does not mean that to track their activity online. You have to, it's just like if you were in the class and you make sure that they're safe online. You know, you walk around and make sure that they're not doing anything. So um, what happened was when I started we were working on these projects, I started to realize other things that um, things on our, our network were blocked like YouTube, any kind of social media. And um, it was pretty crazy that we, we couldn't Google the US Constitution. Google Earth was blocked. Um, the New York State Department of Health, those are just little examples of things that we were coming across. And I said, this is crazy. Let me, let me, I called a friend in a neighboring district and she said, oh no, we have access to YouTube and social media. And she said, you know, it has to do with your internet policies that you have, that this is, um, uh, you, and the guidance that boards are getting, uh, are getting from uh, their, the attorneys school district attorneys. So I said, this, this is really crazy. I gotta, I've got to look into this. So with that, I, I started to call all of the IT heads in Suffolk County, Long Island. And what I learned, to make a long story short, is that depending on who your attorneys are, um, and a, a large part of, a large number of districts in Long Island have this particular attorney, I won't mention the names, and their policies are very, very strict. So they don't want any opportunity for a kid to get access to any kind of images or anything. So they tell the software filtering companies to set, um, set it at the highest um, blocking as, as possible. And even at the expense of kids learning. So what this means to kids, I, I hope I'm, I'm not getting off track here. I hope you're following me and I apologize. Um, what it means to kids who are poor is that if you have your only guided internet access is school, you're not going to learn things consistently. Um, you know, maybe in other wealthy districts that allow their attorneys allow freer access. They 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 really interpret the law in a um, in the way it's intended. It's not meant to blo you know block learning and um, to uh, you know, uh, to hurt kids, it's meant to, to help kids and 
to um, work safely online. So at this point, does anyone have a question? Because I'll just continue. No, no, let's know. stop there if it's okay, Linda, because that's a brilliant point, right? So um, I'll, let me extrapolate a little bit from it, which is you're basically saying access to the internet is critical. And if this is an era in human history, not unlike the advent of the printing press, where all of a sudden you have this massive amount of information that's not, uh, there aren't the same gatekeepers. The gatekeepers are changing, the structures are changing. But you're saying not even having access to the information makes it even harder. So let's springboard from that and let's say, okay, so you have this um, incredible tool of the internet, which is allowing a huge flourishing of content production, producing all kinds of viewpoints that are widely dissimilar. And then we have this technology that allows us to talk to someone in Romania and someone in Ukraine and someone in the US. We're, we're connecting from all over the world and we have different stories. Mm -hmm. And history has already been hard. It was already really hard to determine what really goes on in the world, right? You mean you read a world history book and you're, you're gonna come away with the conclusion that you know, the, the history of humanity is a history of power and control and who controls the narratives. And so, so here we have this massive amount of information and we have this technology that's just allowed us to talk together. Who would like to address this question of how do we even grapple with this? The fact that people have really deeply held different beliefs. I'd really, I'd really like to, um, I, 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 I think I'll give you one example that, that speaks to what you just said, Steve, is that when our Norwegian friends came over, they gave speech, they, they gave workshops about their, their government and just the, the language itself, the, the labels like conservative in Norway is not the same as conservative in the United States. You know, it's more of a liberal type of, of, of party. So, you know, we need to communicate and speak each other languages. When, when the Zika virus started in Brazil, are we going to depend on a small village to tackle that? I mean, it quickly came into Suffolk County. Thank God for the internet, where all the, the labs around the world and the universities were working to figure that out and tackle those, you know, like a pandemic. So there's so many reasons why we shouldn't be blocking things. And the answer I get, you'll be, you will find this amusing, maybe not. Um, I get things like, well, it was miscategorized. The, the, or or um, like Google Earth, which is a, such an amazing learning tool. And if, if anyone hasn't been on it recently, it's, it has all these features that are incredible. That was blocked in our school. And it was because, um, uh, you know, again, miscategorized or some of the things are tied to Getty images, which happen to be blocked or miscategorized. And I've spoken to the software filtering company Lightspeed, which is one of the biggest ones that I'm, I'm aware of. And there is no, the algorithms are just, I don't know how they're figured out, but they just fall where they may. And then they say, we're really not blocking it. You can ask for access. But what kid is going to take the time when you're researching? You're just going to bypass all the stuff that's blocked and use whatever they allow you to use. So you're not you're thinking critically. Super good point. Yeah, I'm going to open a huge can of worms here. And you can ignore me if you want to. But I read all of the research afterwards from the Zika and the original Brazilian scientists have recanted. And they said, you know, Zika was, was prevalent throughout South America and we don't think it was actually the Zika virus that caused the microcephaly. We're concerned that there was a chemical spill or some use of chemicals that was covered over by people claiming it was the Zika virus. So even Zika makes this really complicated. Right, because there's a lot of money involved and all kinds of people who, who get benefit from, from creating solutions to a problem. And you're like, okay, this is really complicated. How do I deal with this? Right. So my question to the Ukrainians, like, do you, do you have this situation? Are you, do you know what, what's blocked and what's not blocked? Are you privy to all that? Um, or do people just operate like us and not ask questions in schools? And, and, and yeah, they, they can hear you. And, and um, I actually kind of want to steer us away from the blocking question. So I'm not sure that's actually the literacy question. I feel like that's a really good issue and one that we should be concerned about. But I'm more concerned about how do you even feel personally literate in a world with so much information and such different beliefs. 
And like I probably read two or three hours a day. And I feel like even then, uh, it's really hard for me to get to the bottom of things and to understand what's really going on. So Matt, I think you want to say something. I do, yeah. Um, I think this is a really complicated question to unpack and it's different in different places. Um, one of the things that we try to do is focus on brain science and acknowledge that one of the things that's really changed in the last 10 years is, um, as you've, as you've noted, is the amount of information that we have access to and the reduction of gatekeepers and the fact that so much more of our information is mediated through, that we, that we read, is mediated through a device like this that is constantly tracking and understanding what it is that I'm most interested in engaging with. In some ways, it is the perfect drug, right? Because it is perfectly adapted to me as an individual. And the richest companies in the world have business models that are built on, um, on my continued engagement. And we know from research that, uh, that engagement is often driven by types of information that, are, um, that, are, um, uh, that tend to, to be unreliable. Um, and we also know that our brains have not really caught up with this way of um, this sort of amount of information and the way it's being, being um, sort of hand delivered to us. And so there is both a policy perspective there, but there's also a skills piece is, is sort of being able to recognize the changes that have happened and the fact that it's happened so quickly that um, we are ourselves often without the sort of um, toolbox that we need to, to process that information. It is an access question, certainly, but it's also just understanding the algorithms and what's being, being delivered to us. And then also understanding what the process that goes into creating media content is, because oftentimes the most manipulative uh, information, whether it's online or other forms of, of information, is information that, um, that is emotionally triggering, right? And so one of the things that we use in our curriculum is to work with both teachers and students, and, and really this is true for anyone, is to simply recognize um, the, the manipulative intent behind um, lots of different kinds of information. Because when you can do that, when you can recognize manipulative intent, that piece of media was intended to make me feel afraid, or it was intended to make me feel excited, or it was intended to make me want to buy something, um, and you're able to attach a word, to verbalize a word that's associated with that feeling, then you're able to regain the rational portion of your brain rather than feeling that sort of um, emotional, emotional trigger. And so we integrate that actually into our curriculum because it's a very simple skill that all of us need. It is not uh, somebody else needs it. It's, a, it's an I need it and Steve needs it and everyone else on this call needs it as well. Um, so that's one of the ways that we've tried to approach this. Matt, hasn't that always been the case though? I mean, in, in many ways, the critical thinking skills reflect the fact that we're cognitively flawed. Mm -hmm. right? So a trial by jury reflects the fact that it's really hard to get to the truth. Innocent until proven guilty reflects the fact that we can, uh, we can put together pieces and assume guilt when it may not be there. Like there are all of these ways in which culturally we've built protections and understandings for our cognitive biases and limitations. I'm not sure that's actually new, but it's very interesting to have large-scale economic incentives to manipulate those. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I think that the principle is not new, but um, the, uh, the, 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 the quantity of information and the business models that are built around, um, around being able to sort of hand-deliver information that you're specifically interested in engaging with um, is, is what's new, right? And so that, um, that really changes the, uh, the, the, the dynamic um, so that we need these skills um, ever more uh, than we have in the past. And in a lot of ways, because of the changes of what's happened in the media, and, and that, now I'm talking specifically in a US context, I wanna just acknowledge that because many of these things have existed in, um, in other countries for, um, for a, a long time now, but um, the, the, some of the changes that have existed in the, in, in the U.S. very, very recently, at least, mean that, um, that we no longer can rely on the, the gatekeepers 
uh, for sifting through and sorting through what is and is not reliable and coming up with a coherent narrative like happened in the past. And so those skills that needed to be taught to editors and journalists in the past now need to be taught to, to all of us. So Matt, here's an interesting example. And, and Marina, I'll come right to you. So I read the Facebook report on fake news, the Atlantic mm -hmm. Council report. And it was really interesting to me because the Atlantic Council didn't call it fake news. They called it disinformation, which has become kind of a more common theme. But they defined disinformation as information which makes it difficult to govern. And I thought, okay, that's really interesting because all of a sudden you've just turned the apple cart over for me. Hmm. I want to think of disinformation as information that's not true. The Atlantic Council is its interesting think tank on, it, yeah. on its own, but it's even, it's even interesting there that you realize, okay, these large scale platforms that have such influence, of course they're going to be of interest to governments. Yeah. Of course. And so, you know, if we put ourselves back in the shoes of any society which is going through large governmental transitions, whether it's Venezuela and Bolivia right now, or it's the United States 250 years ago, or whatever it is, these are deep questions about, you know, who uses material and information to promote narratives for governance. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Marina. Oh, sorry. No, I, I'll take a step back now so some others can um, can share. Go ahead, Marina. Oh, your mic's off. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to say like uh, an ex-Soviet girl uh, that uh, uh, the problem you're struggling with uh, that you have some gatekeepers at school that uh, do not give you access to all the information you need. Uh, it is by itself a great uh, source of learning uh, because uh, asking a question what they are omitting uh, can be more learning than getting access to all the information in the world. Because uh, if you ask a child, okay, so you don't get access to this website, uh, what information could you pro possibly find there? You don't have it now. And when you, like, you, you take a big uh, whiteboard and you uh, start mapping information you have and you don't have, all these white spots, if, if, you, if you learned uh, to ask the correct questions, like all this 5W and H and all this stuff, like really teach uh, journalists. Uh, if you place it all on the, on the uh, board, you get the whole picture where there are places that are not covered with information. And these white spots uh, clearly show manipulations. Like if you want to talk about government and some issues that are covered or not covered, like they are talking about, I don't know, a wall near Mexico, but they do not talk about a wall on near Canada, but they are talking about this one, but they're not talking about this one. Like uh, this very, very simple analysis, it gives a huge resource for students uh, to, to start thinking for themselves. You don't even need the access to all the internet in the world to become media literate. But, and uh, I had a question for Linda, <laughs> before we started this talk, uh, how uh, widespread this problem is in the US when some authorities block uh, access to different websites for schools. Because in Ukraine, wow. we have total anarchy in this uh, part. We only have problems with internet or computers, but we don't, not with access to some websites. You know, I, from my research, I've, I've contacted people in different um, state departments of education throughout the country. And it seems like this is a, a really a national issue. There's it's, it's, that's what I, I was calling it like a dirty little secret. And originally, like I had written a paper about this called the hypocrisy of democracy and internet filtering <laughs> in American education. And now I'm really upgraded that to the apocalypse because it's, it's catastrophic and people aren't talking about it, at least in places like North Korea and Cuba and different places around the world that are, are in, in Africa, that in Africa um, where they admittedly block everything and it's government controlled. As Americans, we're not even aware of what we're not ac accessing in schools. So we're way at a disadvantage, at least if we knew um, that was going on, you know, then we could try to come together and we'd probably be like uh, what's going on in Hong Kong right now in every city, you know, <laughs> in America because 
it's just not talked about. And I was curious to know if Steve, are people, are you aware of people having these conversations? Because it is really um, something that needs to be addressed. And it doesn't seem like there's a lot of information out there. Yeah, I love what you've done, which is you've reminded us that the denying of access to information is one form of control. And it can often be, um, you know, you know, there is a degree to which most people's definition of media literacy is that you agree with my perception of what's going on. <laughs> so then you have to get to a little bit of a higher level than that and say, okay, like Matt said, there are going to be agreed upon narratives, but that doesn't mean just because it's agreed upon that it's truth. Right there, you know, you're going to go to an Aboriginal culture somewhere, or you're going to go to the south of the U.S., or you're going to go somewhere else, and people have agreed upon narratives that aren't necessarily true. So that raises us to sort of another level of it's a willingness to see that people live by narratives, and that narratives aren't always accurate. In fact, narratives are off are almost always not fully accurate. They're sort of a shortcut way of a group of people agreeing on something, and then you get to this level of kind of cognitive issues and understanding that. Like one of the really interesting cognitive issues is that when we fight about something down here, often there's something else up here that we're not seeing that's actually more important. So it's, it's sort of a tactic. It's a political tactic that's been used in the U.S. for 200 years, right? It's like we can get you to fight about some small level thing, but we're not actually addressing the big level. So you go from cognitive limitations to then just sort of are we at a whole new era in terms of understanding ourselves as human beings? by virtue of all this information and having to confront the fact that information has always been a tool of control, right? There's always been ways, there have always been ways in which people control information, whether or not it's your church or your synagogue or at your school. I mean, there is some irony, right? Schools are kind of propaganda factories. I mean, they, they, they exist largely as mandatory public schooling around the world because they're really good forms of governance and control and, and kind of inculcating people into the narrative of your society. So to expect full critical thinking in mandatory public education is probably not even realizable. Okay, so again, I know I go deeply there, but responses, ideas? Uh, uh, can we all agree that there is no such thing as truth? Uh, there is no such thing as full information there is no 100% uh, sure in anything when you go deep down. And oh. yeah, school, schools are um, about propaganda. I'm now working on new Ukraine's curriculum on history and civic uh, subjects. And I'm already thinking about killing myself because uh, all these propaganda issues, you just cannot throw them out and I'm not ready to get them in. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like uh, trying to uh, be more or less accurate, but it is a huge problem. But like right now, I feel it very, very sharply how the uh, politics and how the government influence what we teach in public schools. And this story about public schools is like everyone has equal access to education and everyone goes out from the school getting the exact amount of information and it should be the same from every school. So there's a question I like to ask here, Marina, and I'll say to people, what percentage of high school students graduate as competent adults? Uh, what do you mean by competent adults? You know, they could have a job, live on their own, start a family. Uh, well, in Ukraine, I think the percent is rather high. But uh, from, um, like, I feel like most, uh, most people stop developing in somewhere in 13, 14 years old. They do not get any older through the, their life, like mentally. So uh, if they are not taught uh, all the necessary things by then, usually they go out from school with very vague understanding of economics, of history, of uh, how the world goes around them. Uh, so they are mm, like not, uh, not grown up adults. But I, I could see it from our last elections, unfortunately. Okay, so I want to go back quickly. Marina, you mentioned no 100% truth. I mean, I think a lot of us depended on or relied on like scientific studies and double blind studies and, the, and, and getting published in a peer reviewed journal. And unfortunately, that's kind of taken a beating as well. 
as we've watched editors of major medical journals resign and say, you know, we actually can't tell you that these things we're printing are true because there was so much financial influence at the time that the studies were done. Or, or when they, they uh, revealed this last summer that the, the original researchers on sugar versus fat and heart disease at Harvard were paid under the table. It's like, okay, what can I depend on? How do I have a good conversation? Uh, thought? I keep talking about it. start everything with, as far as we know now, we have such scientific data because uh, life uh, changes. Uh, scientific uh, development goes faster and faster and faster. Uh, like, uh, think of all the diet articles you have read during the last uh, 20 years. Like, don't eat eggs, don't eat butter or you will die, don't eat meat, don't eat, I don't know, cherries. And every two or three years they say, oh, no, 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 wait, wait, you have to eat eggs, now don't eat broccoli. Oh, wait, stop, we have made another uh, scientific research, don't eat broccoli, eat something else. Uh, we did a very small research with 12-year-old uh, kids, and we were developing, <laughs> reading articles on dieting. Like not healthy food, but dieting, about losing weight uh, through uh, 10 years. And through 10 years, the diet changed like 100% and turned back to the, uh, what it was 10 years ago. Uh, no one wanted to lie directly. I don't think any, anyone had an intention to lie. But uh, at uh, certain times, uh, cer certain groups of scientists do some research, they publish their research, and that it leaves its own life. Like there is a, a separate cycle of uh, moving the information between scientists, journalists, and uh, media, and then social media, and then your neighbors. You know. I mean, there is a difference. There is a difference. Them. Sorry, there is a difference between like the tobacco industry, where there was sort of collusion to hide results and misinformation and that kind of thing, and the sort of soft influence of financial incentives that are often, as Matt was talking about cognitive issues, it, they may actually be invisible to the person doing the research. It, you know, they don't realize that's what's going on. But talking about tobacco, uh, I have shown the kids uh, the uh, uh, advertising campaign from, uh, I guess, 1935 or something, like start of the 20th century, when they proposed uh, women to smoke to fight uh, um, early pregnancy uh, issues. So if you feel sick, just have a cigarette. It, it, it was okay. Uh, Coca-Cola was promoting its products uh, to lose weight. Don't have a dinner, have a Coke. You, have, you will have enough energy until the end of the day. And all this stuff. Uh, so there are lots of different influences. Someone does it for money. Someone does it uh, because they want to be famous. Someone does a uh, fair research and then it appears that research didn't take into account something important. Uh, there is always something that can be changed. So we can only operate with the uh, categories we have now. Surely now we understand that 50 years ago tobacco companies were lying, but 50 years ago you didn't have this information. Uh, nobody. But I think, I think it would be naive to think that there aren't companies now that are lying. Meaning, if companies lied 50 years ago, they're lying today. So, uh, you know, it's easy to point the finger at Silicon Valley, but you'd say, okay, if, there's, if there are lessons from history, a lesson is that money influences people, and so you have to be really careful, or, you know, you have to be careful about how you're being influenced, and you have to look for those influences. And that maybe is just the story of, you know, trying to live an enlightened life. Yeah, I just don't, don't fall in love with any theory. <laughs> I, I think we can maintain that point, Steve, and also emphasize the need for these sorts of skills. I don't think we need to sort of throw up our hands and say there's nothing, there's nothing we can know. I think we, in you know, one of our modules, we talk about um, uh, we talk about thinking about um, the the truth of an article or a claim not as an on off switch, but, but as a gauge. And that the process of gathering more information about a particular subject is not a, uh, it's not an either or, it's not binary, 
but it's a, a process of trying to learn more. And you may never be 100% certain, but, um, but it is possible. I mean, we do know more about um, how to live a healthy day, a healthy life today than we did 50 or 100 years ago. And I think, um, I, I think this is my own personal perspective, but I think it's important that we, um, that we acknowledge that and encourage students to seek that out. Because I, I think that, um, that encouraging those sorts of skills is an important foundational piece of a future generation demanding quality, um, thoughtful media and, and journalism. And, um, and we also want to encourage students or really all of us to not be completely cynical about the quality of our media, to, to ser search out and find and be critical of what is not good, um, but to also acknowledge and look for and support good quality journalism. Because if we don't, we're not going to have it. These are such complex issues too, right? Because journalism is also a financially operating environment. And so there are incentives and, and, uh, and you never, you know, you have to, you have to read very carefully and have to read widely across different sources to even pick that out. So this may be another really hard, deep question. And we maybe we'll finish with this and say, thank you. And, and you can respond. <clears throat> but if you read Plato's Republic, there's always been a sense that there, that there are different strata in society. Plato's noble lie was that the people sort into groups and you can, they kind of have to swim in their own lanes. Are we trying to give all students the skills that were previously reserved for a sort of an elite managerial class? Meaning, largely schools have produced people capable of working and working in the world. And then you had a small group who were really taught to think deeply. And, and is it realistic to think that we're actually going to give that deep thinking to every student? And how do we even address that particular dilemma of who, who's going to get the deep thinking education and who's going to get the practical education? Nobody wants to touch it. <laughs> Many, many of us, many, many people weren't formally taught to read and, um, and we've figured out ways to ensure that more people are able to have those skills and benefit from it as well. And I'm, I'm personally optimistic about, um, about our ability to, um, to, um, to teach these sorts of skills to more people to make that possible for, for more people. Um, that's my thought. Oh, Matt, lovely, right? <laughs> I would also like to add something if possible. I think that the key here is the fact that we have to teach them critical thinking, to doubt not everything, but almost everything, because in this way they, uh, they can think and they can understand what the problem are. And another thing we should teach them is to be patient because of the mobile devices, which Matt also mentioned, and we have the cell phones, we have the smartwatches, we don't get the entire story. We get only the headline and we think that's it, I know it. So if you teach them to read the entire story and to be patient to do it, because that's the problem. Actually, with digital generation, which gets information on the spot immediately, in a millisecond, they have access to the information. So to teach them patience, to double check and critical thinking, I think these are the keys to, to the solution and combating, uh, fighting this phenomenon. May I add something? <laughs> no, let's do, yeah, please, let's do final thoughts because we got we should close in a couple of minutes. <coughs> uh, okay, anyone else? Uh, Go on, yes. Yeah, can I talk? Please. Yes, yes. Uh, I was just thinking like, uh, as I am a historian by education, like uh, when uh, the industry realized that they need literate people to operate their new factories, uh, it took just 50 years, less than 50 years, uh, to make 80% of population literate. Uh, 50 years before this, it was uh, thought to be impossible. Like people are too dumb to learn to read and write. Like you cannot take peasants and learn them to read and write. And they did it just in 50 years with no internet, no books, no, nothing. So I'm absolutely sure that now we need 
uh, more literate people and uh, we need it even for politics <laughs> for industries uh, so it can be done and it must be done and we are here to do it good okay we, we should actually break but i'm just because we're going to give people five minutes before they go to the next sessions thank you so much linda marina matt Adina and Helen, that was invigorating. <laughs> I made so many notes of things I want to think about. Thank you so so thanks, much. everybody. Thank if you, Steve. You, you've been up for, I think, two weeks straight without any sleep, I think, you and Lucy. <laughs> You're Are amazing. You I'm not making sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's truly appreciated. What an opportunity this is. It's so amazing. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank thanks. you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.